I am very happy to uh, introduce Eric Rosa. Uh, many of you know Eric's name through the Data Logics story. Uh, however, before Data Logics, he was also part of the Asurian uh, executive team and went to Stanford uh, to earn his MBA. Uh, when they initially raised funds to acquire Data Logics in 2007, uh, in many ways, Data Logics was a struggling data and, and analytics company. Uh, that was hit pretty hard by the recession. And within the eight years of running it as CEO, uh, they ended up selling it uh, and growing it and growing it and selling it to Oracle for uh, 1.25 billion. Um, even today, uh, Eric's day is quite busy. Uh, he is an executive in residence for General Catalyst, uh, runs a CrossFit studio in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, and also is the chairman of a personal fitness software as a service company. Uh, please help me in welcoming Eric Rosa. Uh, all right, Eric, so um, I have to do this, and I apologize, but uh, you know, we're all curious here. What did they put in the water over there at Stanford? We've got a bunch of Kellogg and Booth folks in the audience, and we're, we're dying to know, because you guys just keep parading out and, and hitting home runs and slam dunks. Um, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know how to answer that. I don't know how to answer that <laughs> yeah, question. You know, you know how to answer that. Um, uh, okay, but uh, that being said, uh, uh, the search fund model was, was known to you uh, when you were there, and I know you had some colleagues that had pursued that. How did that experience and those relationships shape your own career at ETA? Um, well, it was, it was still pretty early days. I mean, I think probably search funds had been around for you know, 10 years at that point almost, I think since Irv Grossbeck was at Harvard before he went to Stanford. But um, if you look at like my class, I don't believe that, so I graduated from Stanford Business School in 96. Um, I don't think that there were any, you know, kind of very successful search funds out of that class at all. Um, I had a couple friends who did searches. Um, one, ultimately, he didn't end up finding anything. He was at it for a couple of years. And then two buddies, no, no one did it right out of business school, actually, but they did it a year or two later. Two buddies actually got into a business and, you know, kind of never hit massive strides. So they ended up returning investors' capital, but not beyond that. Um, and the, the biggest search fund success I was kind of associated with, which impacted my career directly, was that one of my roommates was working at Goldman Sachs and interviewed um, to be CFO of Asurian before it was Asurian. It was called um, it was called Mr. Rescue at the time. It was a roadside assistance company, which shows you kind of the the you know tortuous path these things go through. And our third roommate, and you know what goes down is one of the worst pieces of advice ever given, said you really shouldn't go do this thing at Asurian. You know, you, you kind of missed the boat. Why don't you just do a search fund instead? You know, why would you leave Goldman to go be CFO of this company? And luckily, he ignored, I, luckily, A, I didn't give advice that bad. I kind of stayed impartial because I didn't know what I was talking about. And B, our buddy ended up not following that advice and ended up being one of the people who's built Asurian over the last 22 years. Right. And is currently vice chairman, was president in between. So raise your hand if you know what Asurian is. Yeah, that's the stuff of legend around here. So that's that's. <laughs> so should we tell the people who didn't raise their hand about the show? <laughs> right, yeah, I, I, yeah. I think that people that sit next to them can do that. Um, okay, great. Um, wh what did you learn specifically during your time at Assure, and do you think that you know influenced uh, what you did next in your career career trajectory from there? Um, well, so I spent, I was a, you know, at, you know, kind of at best a footnote in the Assurian story. So I was there for, for four years, um, starting a you know, kind of a new, so I was kind of, I've been, I've always been a, kind of an entrepreneur in tech stuff. And, and Assurian was decidedly not a tech company when I joined it. They had this new idea that was a little more tech enabled and that was a raw startup within it. So I kind of joined there as an entrepreneur, if you will. And, um, you know, so it was a new world to me. I was kind of blown away by the power of the model that they had found their way into, again, without intending to, right, to start out, start your life as a roadside assistance company and then become, you know, one of the most valuable private insurance companies in the world is a very 
weird path to go down. And, and it just kind of happened. And now they're, you know, very tech enabled and so on. I think I learned, you know, a lot about the power of focus, the power of the ETA model of bringing people who can bring fresh perspectives, maybe a little more sophistication, access to capital, willingness to swing big, longer term time horizons, all those things. Um, just unbelievable, you know, in, in, unfathomable what, you know, what happened, the businesses they started with and where the company sits today. The pivots today. and the yeah. transformations, yeah. yeah. So that being said, your route to the CEO suite was a little unique. Um, maybe, you know, you can talk about the transition from Shurian, uh, part, being part of the executive team that, you know, acquired and transformed, uh, I believe it was Next Action at the time that was rebranded Data Logics, right? But talk a little bit about maybe that career move. When you're at Shurian, you're thinking about what to do next yeah. and how that kind of process yeah. unfolded. Well, what, like so many things, I mean, <laughs> my, um, my uh, path was shaped as much by, or more by, you know, I hate the term failure because it sounds so damning, but we'll just use that term now to be harsh since it's about me and my career, yeah. but shaped by a failure. We were unable to get this business I was running to a scale that would matter to Assurian. So we got it from zero to about 10 million in revenue, um, starting to, start to flatten out, and some dynamics in the space we were in were making it seem like it wasn't actually going to be as big or as valuable a business as we had hoped. And so we had this kind of very small thing that was struggling to be big enough to be relevant that was part of this bigger rocket ship that was actually growing faster than we were and way more profitably. And so I, I was in kind of the rough position of, of having to recommend that we shut down my baby. And it was just an obvious thing that made sense to do, but it was super painful to do that emotionally. And so um, by then, I think we had probably had about 80 people working at the business. We've been at it for four years. So that was a really tough thing to, to have to deal with. Um, and frankly, I, so I kind of came out of that experience and um, said, well, we were in Nashville, which is where Assurian is based, or where the bulk of Assurian is based. And we, dis we really didn't have roots in, in Nashville or ties, and so decided to move back west and, and settled on Boulder, Colorado. And so I kind of did my own search for a company that I could join. And my, my lens was, um, you know, if someone doesn't really know me well, I don't think they're going to take a bet on me as CEO of a great business yet. And so my view, I'd been a GM but not a CEO, and so I said, I think I could, I think I am credible as a number two guy at a great scaling business it, it, with the right fit. I don't think I'm credible. Like I wouldn't hire myself there right now. So that was kind of the self-awareness thing. So that I, I kind of did my own search that I want to find a, a company that's between 10 million and 50 million ish on both ends in revenue that already has some product market fit and where I can add value as the number two and hopefully earn my way to the top at some point. So that was the, that was the screen that led me to find this, um, it was a catalog uh, um, analytics company at the time, just under 20 million in revenue called Next Action. It actually was not one thing, I'll just uh, update on Nick's intro remarks. At the time, it was not struggling. When I joined, it was kicking butt. It took me being there for a while to get us to start struggling. <laughs> Um, but it's actually true. The company was doing yeah. very well when I joined, but we were about to hit a cliff that my due diligence failed to uncover. Did you, I mean, did you have certain things that you were looking for? And you talked about the position, the opportunity, but as far as the business goes, were there certain characteristics that you were looking for? Was this a geographic search? Well, it was definitely a geographic search, yeah. which we know isn't the best way to optimize <laughs> financial returns <laughs> for shareholders, but it certainly was the best way to optimize life returns for me and my family at the time. I wanted to live in Boulder. Right. Yeah. Right. So I knew that was going to limit the field. And I was, at some level, I had accepted that I would sub-optimize a little bit on my ambitions, which I hadn't done before, yeah. for a great lifestyle for my kids and all the rest of it. And what happened, fortunately, um, again, on this weird, tortuous road we all take, is that we ended up having a much bigger opportunity than we ever could have fathomed, really. And so, ended up not at all sub-optimizing on the professional front, right? right. But that was... I wouldn't say that always happens, yeah. but we were fortunate that it did in our case. When you acquired the company, what did you see? What was the path forward in terms of creating value and growing that business? Well, okay, so a couple things I did, and, and so did not acquire the, let's just be yeah, clear right, here, right? right. So the, the sequencing is a little different because yes. all those things happened, but they didn't, have, it was a kind of a backwards thing. Mm -hmm. So I joined a COO, a new CEO had just joined or joined right after, but they were already talking to him. 
Um, fast forward 18 months and the, the um, core business had greatly diminished. The economy was in the tank. We were in 2008. Um, we were running out of money. Um, the bets on building a digital transformation business hadn't materialized for a whole bunch of reasons. The board decided to make a change with the CEO. And so that's when I became CEO and I had to find new investors because the board was tapped out on capital. And people weren't really putting a lot of money into companies in 2009, especially companies that weren't growing and were losing a bunch of yeah. money. And like maybe you could, sell. you could explain the business model. A yeah, so bit. The, yeah. the initial business model of model is coming next to action was to aggregate data, which we got for free from almost every consumer catalog in the country, and this still happens. So anybody sending you a catalog in the mail would share all of their crown jewels, who's buying what, at what address, exactly what they bought, for how much. And we would then build models and use that to effectively find lookalikes, people that looked like them that hadn't purchased from a given catalog. And then we would sell those names for individual, we wouldn't sell the name, but we'd sell the ability to mail to that name on a blind basis to people who looked like they might be, in, they might be a good fit for them. And then if the person purchases, then the person would own the name. But we could sell effectively the same name a hundred times to somebody over a 10 year period. But they would so never the, get access to the it. The DNA was predictive the analytics. The DNA was predictive analytics and yeah. we had, you know, it was a great 100% gross margin business because we got all the names for free. And um, it had to be transformed into something digital because nobody was betting big on the future of direct response catalogs. Right. And the digital transformation hadn't happened yet, both for internal and external yeah. reasons. And so. The, from a transformation standpoint, our bet had to be making all this great data and intelligence we had available um, to do online advertising, and that's where we, yeah. you know, that's where we took the but business. But domain expertise, digital marketing wasn't your previous domain expertise. It wasn't so. at all zero. Yeah. So you had to teach yourself that on the fly a little yeah, bit. Well, yeah, I had to hire, <clears throat> I had to hire great teachers for that, right? Right. right, right. And had to, what it turned out is nobody really was an expert in digital data at all at the time. Okay. And so we became that expert, right? right. And at some level, this is a weird thing to say, but our, you always have to use things that are different to your advantage. And one of our big advantages was that we didn't have anybody initially who was truly captive to the ways of thinking in the pure digital world. Yeah. And that was incredibly positive. And I'll give you one specific example. At the time, and it hasn't changed dramatically, but at the time when we got started, about 94% of consumer purchasing in the US was done offline, and not zero of that was being inform used to inform online advertising. So we were like, what are big, my, my easy lens on this as an outsider was, what are big categories of where advertisers spend a lot of money where I don't think digital data is that predictive and maybe if we can get offline signals, that will work well. I mean, it's so brain dead obvious. So we said, okay, consumer products, stores that are in shopping malls, cars, those are things that are gonna continue to be bought offline for a long, long time. That signal has to be incredibly powerful if you can figure out who's buying what and then plug it into Facebook and Google and frankly, even to Amazon, which okay. became one of our biggest customers. Was this, we just knew yeah. so much more so quickly than anybody else did about what people were buying offline and how to connect that everywhere for digital advertising. And weirdly enough, when we started, nobody saw that as important. So was this part of a strategic planning process or a value creation plan, or was it more intuitive and reactive? I mean, did, was it part of the investment thesis? How did that all kind of unfold? Well, by the time, so when I decided to raise capital, which was basically as soon as I became CEO and, yeah. and basically recapitalized the whole company, yeah. it was absolutely my pitch. It was the only pitch I had. Yeah. Do you want to do, do, you know, invest in this declining, money-losing okay. business that helps target paper catalogs in the, in the post? you know, the postal service. That didn't resonate? Or do, you, you know, no. or do you want to invest in this great bet on digital advertising data? Yeah. So I had to sell the dream on that. Yeah. Um, I, you know, to say, did it come through a strategic planning process? That would be maybe over uh, glamorizing what we did to be, call it a process. Yeah. But there was a lot of thought given. It was the only hand we had to play, yeah. frankly. But now there was, this is a growth capital raise you're referring to here. At well, this point, it's not share liquidity, or is it both? It was both. Okay. We, we did a full buyout. of yeah. Our lead investor stayed in. Yeah. Everybody else sold, including the founders. Everything was the complete, uh, the, the, the um, sorry, the cap table was completely wiped out. Yeah. 
uh, myself and a few of the senior execs put our own money into the deal. We, yeah. we repriced it down to almost zero. Right. I mean, we, it really, it was a, we've got, we, we, we repriced it at less than one times revenue. Yeah. So the, the, the trajectory, I like telling what happened before the $1.25 billion exit. <laughs> so in, um, in June of 2007, six months after I joined the company, did a um, kind of a secondary, which was ill-conceived, and I had no vote on because I was the COO, valuing the business at $120 million. 18 months after that, I recapped it at a $12 million valuation. So we went 120 to 12, and then five years later, we sold for 1.25 billion. Right, I remember So that. this is the, you know, Winston Churchill, when you're going through hell, keep going. Yeah. We were going through hell, and yeah. we kept going, right? Yeah. I mean, this was are, not are, pointing in the right direction. Are there any stories or words of wisdom in that capital raise? I mean, in that environment? Yeah. With those think, headwinds? Yeah, like I think there advice? are. I mean, I think, it, I remember the, the founder, um, who was not at all really part of the business anymore. He was chairman and he had had aspirations to sell the business for, you know, over a hundred million, which is, you know, was and still is a great exit, right, for a lot of companies. And it just wasn't worth that. And so he decided it's worth that even if the market's telling me it's not and finally got his insiders to do it, which was why that round got done. Um, my view is a little different, which is the company's worth what the market says it's worth. And then I could decide if I'm a seller or not. Yep. And so we hated the deal at a $12 million pre. We absolutely hated it. Huh. But it was the only deal there was. And I didn't really have a viable option other than paring back costs and, um, and holding on for dear life through the recession, right? That yep. was like the only other option. And I wasn't going to do that, right? So we had three other term sheets that were merging with other private companies, you know, what you could you know, affectionately refer to as a merger of weak walls kind of thing. <laughs> and I like this one better because we got to make, we, I had a great team together already, and, or the makings of a great team, and we had conviction. We wanted to go for this. We didn't know it was going to work, but we wanted to go for it. Right. And so I remember a very difficult conversation with the founder um, who was really unhappy, and I can understand he owned a big chunk of the business, it had been valued at 120, now it's being valued at 12. And he was clearly a seller if he had to be. And he said, this is, you know, this is the wrong answer. You need to cut 40% of the team and hold on for dear life. You don't know how long this recession is going to last. And then the clincher was, you're never going to be successful building a digital business in Colorado. People have tried and they always fail. Yeah. And I said, you know, that's interesting precedent. And I actually agree with what you're saying, which is there's a better, fit, better than 50% chance that we're not going to succeed. But this is the hand we have, and this is the, this is the strategy that I'm going to pursue. And he was still chairman, right? Yeah. And he had hired me. Um, and I said, you know, here's the deal. This is what I'm going to do, and I can understand how disappointing it is to you. And if you don't want to do that, I'm OK with it, and here are the keys. Yeah. You take it, and how, you pursue your strategy. How did you keep conviction through that process? <sighs> You put, know, the, put a CrossFit gym in the... Uh... Yeah, I did a lot of working out. I did a lot right, of punishing yeah. myself. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, I did, first of all. I really did. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, you kind of had to. Yeah. I mean, I just didn't have a choice. I remember yeah. a good friend took me out to dinner. who was an investor, and he said, you don't have to do this. This was when the uh, prior CEO was let go, and the board asked me to do it. Uh -huh. And he's like, you don't have to take this. And he goes, I said, yeah, but, like, there's nowhere to go but up here. He goes, first of all, there is. You could go down. <laughs> and second of all, the only guy who's going to be blamed for that is the guy who's in the chair at the time, which might have been true. So one of my big lessons from this is, like, you can always listen to people's advice, but, you, you know, you seldom want to take it. Not right. never, but you got to, you know, you got to have your own internal thing. But I won't, I wouldn't stand here and be revisionist and say I was 100% confident in this at all. Right. Yeah. It's a I was nervous as crap. Like, I wasn't sleeping. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't, it was hard. Yeah. Um, so... You guys grew through acquisition and organically. And we grew, so we grew almost entirely organically right. until we sold to Oracle. So I, I yeah. led the business for four and a half years as the Oracle Data Cloud starting in um, January 2015 until about four months ago. Mm -hmm. And so after we sold, we spent over a billion dollars acquiring other businesses. Yeah. But um, no, we, we, we did very little acquisition. We bought two small companies yeah. that were cumulatively, you know, 
kind of 10% of revenue. Right. Um, so, so that wasn't really core. No, it was, an or, it was an organic thing yeah, uh, yeah. for the most part. But, but we, you know, again, we did over the journey, the 12 and a half year journey pre and post Oracle, we did six acquisitions that were absolutely integral based on either people, technology, right. products, customers to the, to the overall success for yeah. sure. Um, so you're definitely one of the most thoughtful and conscientious people that I know having known you for the time that I've known you. Um, that's a sad state of your, uh, of your social network. Possibly. You <laughs> Possibly. Possibly. I don't think so, though. But, uh, uh, you know, being the CEO of a business that's resource constrained is tough. And you're constantly in triage mode. How did you um, manage your time and manage your stress in, uh, in a business that was, you know, both transforming plus also in a pretty high velocity industry? Yeah, I think one of the things that, that I feel like I've learned and it's become really important to me is the notion of, of trying to do kind of a series of, of low cost experiments. Mm -hmm. You know, what are the most important things you have to learn? And one of the things, I, I kind of started to say this earlier and then I, um, I got a little, a little bit of a digression as I was talking. Um, when I joined Next Action, this catalog analytics company, one of the uh, many pieces of due diligence I failed to do was, um, was to look at the total addressable market. It was also something they had never done. And so when I looked at the total addressable market, for example, at this Next Action, this catalog company, I looked at, wow, this company's had a great trajectory, but wow, the whole market is valued at $100 million. It's certainly not gonna grow. It's probably gonna shrink, and it might shrink dramatically. And there are five players in the market. Yeah. Holy shit. So what I did then, and I could flash forward, flash forward, what I did then was twofold. One is I'm like, this market has to consolidate. I didn't know anything about doing M&A at the time, and I'm like, we've got to merge with one or more of our competitors. We have to take these people out. It's going to be an incredibly unhealthy market. And at the time, three of five companies were very profitable, including ours. This is before the downturn. And I think we did $8 million in EBITDA the year I joined, and then it went to zero the next year. You can wow. you know, credit me with a lot of that. Um, and so we had to consolidate the industry. It wasn't going to be healthy. And yeah. none of the competitors, for various reasons, were willing to do it. So that was one thing I did. It's like, we've got to consolidate this industry, and then we have to find growth vectors and be serious about them. So that's become a big part of how I spend my time. And now as I've evolved into being more of a chairman and an active board member with others, and, and, and you know, then informal mentor and so on beyond that, I spend a lot of my time on these growth vectors, what are kind of adjacencies, either organically or through acquisition, that we could test the waters with, and I want more than one, yeah. and I want them to be very contained um, experiments where they don't, I don't want to do bet the company kind of things. I mean, we had to bet the company, yeah. but that's not the way to do it, right? The way to do it is there's got to be three or four things nearby if we're, if we're broad enough in our thinking that, ha that aren't incredibly stupid to think about. And then how can you make the right bets, sequence them right, and, res and resource them at the right level to learn more? And so that's a, that's a big part of, I think, what the value that I add now when I get involved in companies, but also part, an even more important thing is helping the CEOs and the exec teams find part of their brain and part of their energy and part of their time to focus on that amidst the chaos and fire drills. And you, yeah. you know, Alex, you live this as an entrepreneur every day, right? You're nine months into your own recap. And how do you find time to look at adjacencies, yeah. but also contain them? Right. Because you could never, my, what I learned early on as we built out our digital business at Data Logics is if it's, if it's not protected a little bit from the core business, it's gonna fail. For, for any number of reasons. Like you'll give it the wrong level of capital, the wrong level of attention, people will withhold information or resource, you know, because you get all these tribal, tribal things going on. So you've got you to decide which bets you're gonna make and then kind of protect that investment and, re and constantly reassess what did we learn? Do we wanna, do we wanna double down? Do we wanna cut that off for now, move to this one? So you have to be very yeah. unattached to what you thought. So are you talking about operational and cultural integration as well as like Everything. strategically? Everything. Everything. So I'll, I'll give you an example. So we, with the digital group, we um, brought in a guy to run it. Um, and um, he, um, you know, he was accountable right to me even though we had zero in revenue and we had 20 million in revenue somewhere else. And he hired people who were kind of more expensive and more digitally native and we moved them out to Colorado and they sat in their own area 
and they got disproportionate resources and capital, and sure enough, everyone else got resentful about them, yeah. and they were kind of snobby about the other people. And I saw well, the advantage was I saw this in our customers and our partners. Same exact thing happening everywhere as everybody was trying to digitally transform right over the last ten years. Yeah. It happens everywhere, and so if you can be thoughtful about that, so I had to think about like when are they at the right stage to mainstream them, and what does mainstream? What am I going to be willing? to share resource on it, which ones still need to be separate. And of course, they lobbied. We've got to be completely separate. Yeah. And others are like, we've got to integrate them completely. But very simple, very basic things I did is one is we had two digital businesses, and I decided one was way more important than the other. It was pretty obvious about six months in. And I took the guy who was running both, and I said, you have good news. You get half the job you had before. You've done such a great job. But we're going to really bet on it. And he was kind of pissed, and he said, how can you be cutting my empire of whatever, eight people in half? And I'm like, yeah. well, because this half of the empire, I think it's gonna be hundreds of people. Did it and this other one's yeah. gonna, and that's exactly what happened. So that was one. Another example is physic, talk about tactical. I made them move their seats after six months or 12 months. They said, look, we've got enough heat and energy. This thing's gonna make it. Yeah. I'm now sick of this like us versus them thing. And it took, it took a couple of years to really knock that out. You guys have to start associating with the commoners here who actually pay the bills every day. Yeah. So what were the, I mean, did you maintain separate P&Ls? Were they, I mean, were the synergies cost-related, revenue-related, strategic, um, I mean, like building moats? Synergies and dissynergies ran yeah. rampant on every vector, right? There right. always, there was nothing yeah. that was like, I'm, I'm kind of not a black and white guy. So there were synergies yeah. and dissynergies available everywhere. Yeah. Um, we had some version of a P&L. It wasn't a full P&L yeah. um, that they were accountable for. I mean, we certainly, for, as an example, we went from 100% gross margins to something much, much lower in digital. Yeah. I had to have the GM looking at gross margin. I didn't want him as w worried as much about um, headcount and operating leverage yet because there were so many shared resources. So that wasn't a thing for him. He just had to sell me on headcount and I was able to override it or whatever. But on a gross margin basis, he definitely owned, you know, he definitely owned a COGS and a gross margin yeah. number against revenue. And how were they financed? Were they financed with external equity capital? Did you finance them organically? Like yeah. Um, External equity capital. So okay. we recapped with, when we became Data Logics, we recapped, brought in General Catalyst at this, you know, great valuation of $12 million. Right. And, um, and then we actually were able to run the business for several years like that until we were, you know, we got on a track from being like wobbly to like, feels like this thing's going to work to, oh my God, what, we had a tiger by the tail. Yeah. And when, you know, the, one of our biggest kind of uh, breakthroughs was after multiple years convincing Facebook to work with us. Yeah. And then through some incredible, um, you know, good fortune and persistence, and then followed by great execution, we became incredibly important to Facebook and became their most important partner and had them talk about us on their first three earnings calls and all that. And that made our brand with everybody. Right. And, um, and so that was, you know, that was an example of kind of making a really big bet. And then we had that. So then we raised, you know, we raised a Series B with a very high, you know, right. hundreds of million dollar valuation. Which is interesting. A Series B on a, on a growth recap is an interesting situation, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah and then uh, we did, you know, and then we did a Series C as well. We brought mm -hmm. in a big mutual fund, Wellington, right before we filed to go public right. also. So um, uh, beginning with the end in mind, uh, was Oracle, did you know that this is a business? That they, did you build the business for acquisition, I guess is the question. Or were you more looking at exploiting these opportunities and building a business that would look, was going to last? Yeah. Or what was the what was yeah. the I mean, I, I'm not somebody who would want to build a, a business for acquisition unless yeah. I was really forced to in some way. Yeah. Like I, to me, that for me to have integrity in a process, I want to build something great and lasting, or try to at least. And yeah. so my view was build something great and lasting, and importantly, not just in its own right, but become important to big, valuable companies because something, something good will happen then. And that very much was the strategy we had, right? We were constantly tracking um, what big, valuable companies are we important to. Right. You know, we're important. Oh, good. We're important to Facebook now. We're important to Google. We're important to Amazon now, and Twitter, and Snapchat, and Visa, and Mastercard. And so you go. And those, none of those were actually as customers. Those were as partners. And then you know, and then as customers. And then good things happen. And the business's inherent fundamentals were in not on the profitability side, by the way, but on the growth side and gross margin side were were good. Um, and so then it was like good things will happen. But the intent was absolutely to sell it. And then we, when we realized we could go public, 
we changed our point of view on that That's and that right. it could you know and that it could potentially be a good public company but then yeah. once we filed to go public and word of that leaked in, in the journal and all that then we had a few people who had always been interested in acquisition got louder and we and a few others kind of came in the mix and then it became clear that selling was the best option for us yep um, so uh, you know, as, as I've gotten to know you, I would say that you've also evolved and, and I've watched it and admired it, um, not just as a leader and a, a culture carrier, but as a, as a human being. And um, how would you say, you know, throughout this process and the dark times of, you know, um, uh, dealing with recovering the business and, and transforming it, how do you feel like you've changed as a person? <sighs> um. It's funny because in some ways, right, you don't ever change that much as a person. You're the same person you were sure, whatever so. when you were five or something, right? right? right, right, right. But um, I think, you know, this process, it, it gave me the opportunity. And if we go back to kind of the experience at Asurian where my little group crushed it for, you know, had a brutal first year, crushed it for two years, and then had a brutal fourth year and then shut down. Um, I, a lot of humility built into it. So I, I think maybe the number, a couple number one things, so tied for number one. One was, you know, all the entitlement that I, I didn't even have a word for it that I think I had felt from the early privilege of, you know, being born into an educated family and all that and having, you know, being pretty good academically and having these things happen, all this entitlement that you somehow deserve any of this. I think was really pushed out of me. All, on my good days, all of that's gone, so that you don't really have an expectation that the world or life owes you anything, right? right. That boy, that's a helpful prism to have, yeah. right? If you believe that reality minus expectations equals some level of happiness, the low, you can't really control reality that much. Expectations you can work on, and so that I think that that's been incredibly valuable to me. As you know, as you get, I've been knocked around by life a bit, as you know, pers on the personal front yeah. in the last year, yeah. at a level that I yeah. would never have conceived. And I yeah. think that that learning from the professional side has been incredibly helpful there, not to take anything for granted yeah. and not feel entitled. I think the other one, which is related but it's different is just becoming more and more authentic as a person, realizing who you are, accepting your limitations. Um, not being obsessed by them and trying to be less, you know, self-flagellating and all that about it, but yeah. like accepting like these are the things where I add value, these are the things that I don't, where I don't, et cetera. What makes me happy, not how am I going to impress other people, all those kinds of things. So I think those have been really important. On the authenticity front, what's been, what was really cool for me was fully liberating myself to be, you know, at some level a bit of a character, you know, an atypical kind of tech CEO or, you know, whatever, and go, you know, the things that are really important to me as a person, I'm going to embrace and try to bring, bring them into the workplace as part of our culture. I, I think so much about culture, and I think culture, the one non-negotiable on culture in a, in a business, I think, or any, any enterprise, it has to be a authentically aligned with the leader's value system. If it isn't, it just doesn't work. Ultimately, it blows up in some way. And so for me to try to integrate my value system in a way that was relevant and valuable to building this business and to the team that we recruited there, and then to have that transcend being an independent company, and at least for the first four and a half years at Oracle, have that stuff be cultural, rele culturally relevant, because I didn't get to choose the culture at Oracle, right? right. I didn't get but to choose the legacy of... Talk about how, how you did that at Datalogix. How did you infuse your values and create yeah. the culture of performance that well, you did? That's there were a couple really things. I think, um, you know, if, I, if I, I'll pick two of them. Yeah. One was I kind of set this credo up for myself. I think it was when I was coming out of business school, and I really was unsure what I wanted to do, and a lot of my classmates seemed very sure what they wanted to do and they spent their last spring term so happy playing golf in the sun in Palo Alto and all that. And I was really struggling. I didn't know what I wanted to do, um, hadn't figured it out, had a bunch of offers that I was really unexcited about. And so I was really struggling personally at that time and I kept reminding myself, and this, so this is a little credo I developed for myself at the time, that my goal is not to optimize tomorrow, right, or today. It's to kind of learn and have fun and make a difference. So I was like, if I could keep these, I think, what is that, six words, learn, have fun, make a difference in mind um, as kind of a medium-term goal and try to do a little bit of that every day, I can kind of hopefully trust that something decent is going to work out. Like, that's going to be a life worth living. 
And so that was one of my things for, um, and that became one of our core values at Data Logics once I became CEO, was you know, we try to learn, have fun, and make a difference every day. Even on the shittiest day you could ever imagine, you could probably find a way to do those three things. And it was really important to, understand, to, to believe that having fun was part of it, you know, that you got to be energized. Learning, right, was this, con you're going to be, if you're in a great situation, or actually even if you're in a bad situation, if, you're, if you engage fully in life, you're going to learn in spite of yourself. But if you actually make that a conscious goal and you create the resources around people to have continuous learning, it, it's a massive accelerator. If, you, know, you create feedback loops, you try to retain humility, all that kind of stuff. And so we, we, had like, we set up this Data Logics University when we had just 150 people. To put this woman who was already with us as an operations director, made her the dean of, of Data Logics University, and I got really personally involved in kind of educating people on things that matter to them. So there's this learn, have fun, make a difference. And then the other big one for me was um, the notion that it was really important to take care of yourself. So we brought kind of health and fitness very, very actively into the workplace and got profiled in some really big national publications for kind of having this health and fitness first culture. And it, it not only energized people who were there, but it attracted the kind of people that we wanted. Yeah. And um, so those were both huge If you payoffs. want to meet with Eric Rosa, you have to do CrossFit as a studio, by the way, and get ready to get up early. I've had, but, I've had a few of those meetings but, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you have. <laughs> but it wasn't like a mandate. You know, when we yeah. put a CrossFit gym in the office or we have nutritionists come in or whatever, yeah. it wasn't like you must do this or you're unwelcome here, right? And you have to strike yeah. a balance. It was more like this is the kind of culture that believes our job is to make you healthier and happier as a human being. Yeah. If you want to meet us on that dimension, you choose whether you want to, but that's what we value, right? And we, yeah. we, you know, we put our money where our mouth was on that. We eliminated vacation time tracking like seven or eight years ago, or eight years ago. It was a long time ago. Most people hadn't thought about doing that yet. So we, we very much, we kept showing that we walked our talk, and it was easy for me to do that because it was authentically who I was. Right. And that's where I come back to, like, if you're, if you're, like, in a persona or I should do this because so-and-so said this or because, we're, you know, employees are going to like it, it's more of a cynical or Machiavellian kind of thing, which is too harsh to say, but, like, that's very different than when it's an authentic expression yeah. of who you are and it happens to align well. It yeah. just works, you know. Well, well continuous it's improvement effortless. and continuous learning, they're just, it, they're in your DNA, right? Yeah, so, yeah, now, yeah. Now, post-Oracle life, let's talk about that a little bit. Okay. How are you satisfying those itches now? Yeah. And, and I know we talked a little bit about your role now as an active investor, right, in helping sort of operators, young operators, you know, create value and, and develop their own businesses. Talk about how you're synthesizing, again, you know, your own characteristics of wanting to achieve those things and serving in those roles. Well, I thought about when I was getting ready to leave Oracle, right, I thought about, I had always thought that I would stay there until I took another great CEO gig yeah. and just kind of do that serially forever. I couldn't picture not operating full time due to, again, some personal circumstances changing, including becoming unexpectedly a single dad, you know, um, and so on. I was like, you know, I've got four little kids. I just wasn't in the mode where I had the energy to be, um, to be a full-time operator. It wasn't because I was beaten down by Oracle or this 12-year ride. I had full energy from that. I just realized I had to be there for my family in a fundamentally different way. Um, and so as I came to that realization over the last year or so, yeah, it's probably about a year that I became clear on that. Um, I said, well, what am I going to do? Am I going to do nothing for a while? And, you know, I got, again, to this thing about getting advice and then ignoring it, right? Duly noted, I'm going to do something else. It was my favorite <laughs> retort to that. Um, you know, everybody who knew me said, you know, dude, you need to take a year off and do nothing. And I was like, thanks for the advice. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> um, and so what I realized the best thing was how could I, and then, you know, there was the other thing was like, do I want to invest full time and do kind of boards full time, just fly around? And I realized those weren't really me either. And so this question was, how could I satisfy kind of an, op, an operator, entrepreneur itch, but not do it full time? And the answer was this you know, model that, that I'm, I'm still working through and evolving, and I don't think it's necessarily a permanent incarnation. I don't even know if it fully satisfies me yet. I still have existential angst around it, but where there are three or four companies, uh, three companies and then two nonprofits, where I'm a very active um, 
you know, very active board member, in one case chairman, and the other board member where, when I say active meaning, not like, oh, there's a quarterly board meeting and I talk a lot more than everybody else, which I do, um, but it, it's more, you know, in, in two of the cases, I'm in the office every week for two hours. So I can go really deep on operations, on strategy, any area, I always say like no, kind of no job too big or too small, and satisfy that itch as an entrepreneur, as an operator, but also incre increasingly as kind of a coach and mentor and, and teacher and all that. So I, it's a good combination. It gives me flexibility right now, for now in my life. And you know, I don't at all rule out that I'll operate full time again. I think I will, okay. but I don't know. You know, I, I, I look at that on quarter by quarter basis, not week by week or year by year basis, sure, kind right. of. So I think we've run out of time. I, I want one parting thought from you for the audience. We have a bunch of folks that are embarking on ETA careers or you know, kind of maybe are uh, early into that. What advice do you have for them? You know, if you were to rewind and tell yourself something 10 years ago, what would it be? I think, you know, it seems like I should have some stock answers to that, but I'll, I'll, let me tell you guys one thing that I've been working with myself. I, I've always, I've come out, I always identified myself as very analytical, um, and I, like I was a math guy even in first grade or whatever, right? So I've always been kind of a, and obviously I was running a data and analytics business, but so I've always identified with being, you know, one of the more analytical people in any given room, and I had to begrudgingly realize that almost all the best and most important decisions I've made in my life, intuition has played a large, if not dominant, role. And so for me, coming from the analytical side of the equation, accepting this, if you were gonna do like kind of the, you know, whatever, cheesy kind of body part thing, you could talk about the three things of the head, the heart, and the gut, which I actually kind of like that model, even though, you know, you just take that metaphorically. And allowing those three things to be equal partners is really hard, I think, for almost all of us. And you know, given you know, a lot of the DNA of the folks in the room, I'm guessing you guys probably biased more, more towards my end, but probably there's some people in here are more, well, actually, I'll, I'll do a show of hands. Who here is more of a head person on the head, heart, gut continuum? Who is more a gut person or a heart person? Oh, so that's a good, that's a good mix. And so I think on both, no matter where you're starting, some awareness about that and allowing the other one to emerge as an equal partner, I get really frustrated, or I have historically, I'm trying to get better about this, about people who come more from the heart and the gut side and don't really uh, work on an analytical framework for things. But I, I, now I can be equally kind of self-deprecating about for how long I've had this, these analytical frameworks and not accepted the role intuition was so obviously playing already for me. So I think that's a good one, is try, try to find that kind of almost yin-yang balance between, between the two and accept that wherever you are dominant, you've got to balance that either with yourself or with a partner who doesn't, you know, it could be a significant other, it could be a buddy, could be a mentor, could be a business partner balance that out because I just think you get to a much better answer. Than, and, I, and again, I've seen it so often in my life that both parts need to play equally. Great, so. great answer. Okay, so I, we will open up uh, questions here to the audience. Uh, we've got a few mics, I think, floating around. Hi, how's it going? Thanks for being here. Hi. A um, little bit of a different kind of question. Since you're raising four kids and you've kind of gone on this journey of, you know, things working, sometimes having to go out on your own and like make things work for yourself, taking risks, how are you raising them to be business leaders in the future that you're proud of? What sorts of things are you taking from your journey that you're going to hope to instill in them as they grow up? Um, so I've kind of accepted um, that... I don't know if any of my kids is necessarily going to be a business leader. Like, I have no idea. So, Mike, I mean, you know, nothing more humbling than being a parent, right? And um, realizing how little control you actually have around the outcomes. And so, what I'm trying to do is try to, trying to do, I think, do two things is doing what I can to model for them, because I've realized that's way more important than telling them 
what you try to do as, a, as, as somebody who's growing into their own authenticity as a human being. And so um, I try to model that for them. Again, I find the showing is better than the telling um, with kids and with everybody else too. Like they're not that interested in my advice most of the time, right? Um, and then the other one is to um, encourage them just to do what, we're, you know, follow where their passions are and what they're most interested in and try to reduce, I, I was so, I had it so wrong, the construct of, you know, this notion that I was going to raise these, you know, scholar, athlete, blah, blah, blah kids and that that was somehow the goal of parenthood. I mean, just totally wrong, right? Um, and so I'm just trying to, yeah, I'm trying to have a, help them understand that whatever they do is going to be great as long as it's aligned with who they are, that I want them to work hard at things, generally be good people. And these are sounding, sounds, sounding so trite that I, I have to back off from right now. And I just have like a, a greeting card sentiment on it. But, and then also really, and I always tell friends who are newer to parenthood than I am, you know, the other thing is like folk, see your relationship with the kid as separate than what you're, how you, that you're trying to make them better and realize those are sometimes at odds. Like sometimes building a great relationship with your kid means you have to let them go that they haven't done their homework in three days or whatever and let them kind of fail at that. And so balance, it's equally important, not equally, but you know, secondarily important that I have a great relationship with them for the rest of their lives. And so I have to realize those aren't aligned always. Those are probably the two things. Hey, how's it going? Tallis and Humphrey, uh, Oracle alum. Yeah, you know what they say Hi. about Oracle. <laughs> but um, congrats on the, the acquisition. Um, my question is, how do you went about hiring um, just your team and building that team around you to, to teach you to uh, execute? Um, so just general hiring process? Is that the question? Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, we've, we weren't very good, you know, or I, I should take credit for that or blame. Like, I don't know that we were that good at hiring initially. We made a lot of mistakes early on. And, you know, I actually had to let two COOs go within about um, a year and a half of each other. And so that was absolutely, you know, a, a large part of that is on me because I put somebody in the wrong role or, um, or didn't give them the support they needed, but ultimately they weren't making it happen at the level we needed to, to go forward. So we learned a ton about that. I mean, I think a couple things. One is I think it's really valuable to meet a lot of people in a hiring process. So I think it's important to be time efficient in terms of elapsed time. So don't, if, you, if someone's interesting, I think you wanna get to a decision within a couple weeks, um, maybe even faster in today's talent market. But I don't, I think the amount of, so elapsed time should be as short as possible, but time spent, I actually am a big fan of doing a lot of time spent. So I, you know, we would a lot of times have 10 interviews, even for pretty junior roles. And, um, and we found that really, I mean, every interview was kind of more data. I was, I, I had a couple, uh, one time in particular, but a couple times that I interviewed pretty seriously for CEO roles after the Oracle acquisition. And I would be shocked sometimes that I'd meet two or three people and they would intuitively be ready to make me an offer. And I was like, you gotta be kidding me. We didn't, you know, neither of us has nearly enough data. You know, the, more, the more discussions, the better, even if they're not heavily substantive, there's just more data being accumulated. So that would be, I think, one of the key things. Lots, lots of discussions held in a very short elapsed time. And the other one is as soon as somebody knows they're not the right hire, should be cut off. So one of the things, because you don't want to waste anybody's time, and this is hard, and people seldom have the courage to do this, but they need to do it. If somebody comes in for five interviews and the first person meets them and says, this is a disqualifier, the rest of the day should be canceled immediately. And, and almost nobody does this because it's a hard discussion, but the best thing to do is to have that person reflect. And so the first person has to be empowered to make that decision. And the second and third say, really enjoyed meeting, really enjoyed meeting you. I think it probably doesn't make sense to continue the discussions today. Either say, we don't think this is the right fit, or we need to do some regrouping on our end. If you have to make an excuse, that's fine as long as you're not lying about it. 
but you gotta, you gotta conserve time on both sides. And then be really respectful with people, right? You know, there's not a fit, happy to give you feedback if that's helpful to you, I think is, a, and it should always be voice to voice, never in an email. Um, so I think those are really, because you want those people to be ambassadors for your company, even if they don't get hired. Um, and then another thing that I think um, almost nobody does because it takes work and it's a complete missed opportunity is creating some level of scorecard for the position. What will success look like in this position? And then not ask people, do you think you'll be good at building revenue from five to 50 million, right? Because the answer to that is yes, right? That's like an intelligence test in an interview. But what you want to do instead is like say, what do we want to have seen them done in, what do we want to see that they've done in the past that will be indicative of success on this element of the scorecard? And it's kind of like if it's, I found it really valuable because hiring managers always want more people. If you say, how many people do you want in the next budget cycle? No one ever has said zero, right? No hiring. So the answer is, okay, you got three people. Okay, now you're going to post this job. Great. Where's your scorecard? Haven't done it yet. Okay, get that, get that scorecard done and then you can post it. It weeds out, if it's not worth somebody's time to spend a couple hours thinking through success criteria for a job, that is a great filter that you should not be hiring that role or maybe just not under that person because they don't know how to prioritize their time. So that's probably another trick I would use. Hi, good afternoon. Um, my question is, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble looking at you, so if I'm looking down, it's just the spotlight. <laughs> um, but you're now like an advisor and a mentor. So what are some things that get you excited about businesses that people bring to you? What are things that we should be looking for as searchers to sort of uncover value that might not be obvious on the surface? Yeah, I, I love that because I, I thrive on passion. As I said, I'm so intuitive. So even though I like to pretend that I'm very analytical, I realize, wow, I'm probably at least 51% intuitive. So. Uh, um, the things that get me excitement is, excited is when the people are legitimately excited themselves about something and, and they're non-delusional, right? Someone's excited and they're delusional, right? Or they're, you, you know, but if I see a legitimate excitement and I also get excited about the product itself, um, I get incredibly excited. So I'll, I'll give you an example. There's a business that we're looking at right now with General Catalyst. Um, that has, I mean, this has a lot of the attributes I look for, but one is it's, it has, from a very, very small base, it has 8Xed this year. And so um, that got really exciting, and I love the mission of what they're doing also. Um, it's, it, it's in the, the broader spectrum of, um, of behavioral health, and it's really a really cool breakthrough kind of tech enablement platform, but that honors the fact that a lot of behavioral stuff has to be connected and face-to-face. -face. And it's a really cool business. And um, we just went through, I, I'm a product guy at heart, and we, I, I think like the peop people and product are the things that get me the most excited. Um, and so we just went through yesterday, actually, a big um, product demo with, with, with them. And I just got incredibly excited because of the simplicity of the product. And I was like, wow, this is actually solving the need and doing it quite elegantly, taking all this friction out of these processes, blah, blah, blah. So I think it's that combination. I mean, I, you know, I fall in love with the product. I fall in love with the people pursuing it. And then, obviously, the business model doesn't have to be, um, you don't have to use the, the emotion of love, even though you, you love a great business model and great financials. But that's probably more the analytical side. I think we have one more. So uh, I want to know as successful as you are, what are the things you're working on from self-improvement perspective? I'm sorry, I missed the last part of that. From a what perspective? Uh, self-improvement. Oh, self-improvement. Um, a lot. <laughs> um, I'm, I think, so I'm very conscious of when I'm in kind of a more, increasingly conscious of when I'm in a creative versus a reactive mode. I had this incredibly formative thing said to me by one of my guys at one of our team members when I was at Asurian. Um, I had hired this guy and he was doing a great job. And he came, we had a meeting that went really well. 
he came into my office and I was really excited and passionate and he turned around to me at the end of the meeting and I think with all good intention, it was, it was actually awesome feedback. He said, Rosa, when I come out of a meeting with you, I either feel like I'm walking on air, which he was then, or like I've been hit by a bus. And, I was, and that really hit me hard to a point where I can still quote that verbatim. That's not a proxy. That's, those are exactly the words that he used, right, like 14 years later. And I ran into him on a plane like six years ago or five years ago. I hadn't seen him at all. And I quoted it back to him. I said, this is one of the most meaningful pieces of feedback I've ever received. And so I think I, you know, I realized that my ability to get really passionate about that on the downside can have a lot of collateral damage on people. And um, they can personalize it, meaning they, they feel like what I'm saying is about them as a person, even though it isn't. I've, I've never been personal in, in my passion when I'm upset about something. It's always about getting better in the, pro in the process, but human beings tend to take things personally, right? So that's one area that I continue to work on. I think I've improved, but I think I still have a long way to go. And that's, again, tying it back to the question about kids, right? So important with kids when I'm, you know, when I'm being a stickler for process improvement to realize that an eight-year-old might not realize that when I'm being critical of the process, it isn't devaluing them <laughs> as my kid. So I, I think that's probably the most important thing that I try to work on right now. Well, I think that concludes our fireside chat with Eric. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming out. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks. So.